Hey guys, today I'll show you a crime thriller TV series named Breaking Bad Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in the sparsely populated outskirts, where a middle-aged man named Walter, wearing a gas mask, was only clad in his smelly underwear, racing in a second-hand Tesla. A young guy seated in the passenger seat was sunk into a deep sleep snoring like a pig. It seemed there were also two bodies lying in the car. Hearing the distant sound of police sirens, Walter grabbed a gun and a camera from the car. While recording himself, he divulged some personal information and bid a farewell to his wife and child. After finishing, he walked onto the road to flex his smelly underwear, aiming the gun straight ahead. To understand just what Walter has been through, we need to go back three weeks. Walter was a high school chemistry teacher. He had once shown bright, not only receiving a Nobel Prize for his research project, but also leading the field in crystallography and the study of proton radiation effects. The reason he settled for a high school teaching position was naturally complex. His wife, Skylar, was a meticulous accountant, currently pregnant with their second child. Their eldest son, Junior, was a simple and good-natured boy who had suffered from polio as a child, leaving him with some mobility issues and a speech impediment. Early in the morning, Skylar had prepared a warm breakfast to celebrate Walter's 50th birthday. From their conversation, it was evident that they weren't wealthy, but their life was joyous. After breakfast, Walter drove Junior to school, as both father and son were at the same high school. On the podium, Walter was engaged in teaching, but not all students were respectful. A slacker openly flirted during the lesson until Walter called him out, prompting the student to return reluctantly to his seat. The birth of a second child meant increased financial pressure. To earn enough for baby formula, Walter worked as a cashier at a car wash in his spare time. When the car wash staff took an unexpected leave that day, they were shorthanded, and the boss asked Walter to fill in. As luck would have it, a rich student came in for a car wash, and a round of mocking and ridicule was inevitable. Exhausted, Walter returned home that evening to an unexpected birthday surprise party thrown by his wife. The spotlight, which should have been on Walter, was stolen by his flamboyant brother-in-law, Hank, an agent with the DEA, who proudly regaled everyone with tales of his heroic deeds. He'd recently busted a drug ring and seized 700000 in drug money. Walter was astonished. He couldn't make that amount of money in a lifetime of work. Hank told him that if he was willing, he could join him on the next operation to see some action. Hank's offer was merely a show of his own capabilities. The next day, Walter went to the car wash to work as usual when suddenly a sharp pain struck his chest and he collapsed. When he came to, he was on an ambulance stretcher. At the hospital, after a series of tests, the results hit him like a bolt from the blue. It turns out he had lung cancer and it was terminal, with no opportunity for surgery. Distraught, Walter returned to the car wash, only to face exploitation from his boss. Walter, who usually held back, lost his temper, unleashing a tirade and firing his boss on the spot. Worried about his limited time and the incomplete savings for baby formula, a bold plan began to brew in his mind. Before dawn the next day, Walter contacted Agent Hank, wanting to join him on the field. The operation took place in a building, with Hank leading the team while Walter stayed in the police car. Soon the drug dealer Emilio was arrested, and another dealer made a desperate escape by jumping out of a window like a chicken, a scene Walter witnessed. He recognized the fleeing dealer as his former slacker student back at the high school, Jesse. Walter did not reveal Jesse's whereabouts. Instead, he watched him escape. That night, Walter found Jesse's home address using student records. Jesse thought Walter had come to lecture him, but to his surprise, Walter was there to propose a partnership. He had extensive knowledge of chemistry theory, but lacked practical experience in drug making. A collaboration with Jesse would make it all work. After hearing Walter's plea, Jesse was in disbelief. Walter had always been a model educator. Despite his initial refusal, Jesse had no choice. A rejection could mean Walter turning him in and getting jailed. Thus, two unlikely partners formed a drug-making team. It's not hard to understand why Walter took this path. His wife was pregnant with the second child, his son physically impaired, and now he was uncertain how long he could hold up. Only this way could he make enough money in the shortest time possible. Taking advantage of his position, Walter took some chemical lab equipment from the school lab and transported it all to Jesse's house. Armed with beakers and measuring cylinders, Walter was brimming with confidence about their new venture. However, Jesse thought the fancy equipment unnecessary, as his drug-making practices had always been simple, typically requiring just one measuring cup. It was sheer luck he hadn't had an accident yet. With a full set of tools in hand, the next step was to find a location for their drug production. 
Jesse suggested they could buy a used car to serve as their mobile lab. As long as they drove it to a deserted spot, they could carry on their business unnoticed. Without hesitation, Walter withdrew his life savings from the bank. It was almost enough, and he handed it all over to Jesse. Holding the cash from Walter, Jesse felt like he was dreaming. He couldn't fathom why Walter would suddenly turn to drug dealing. Walter didn't disclose his true circumstances, simply stating that he had come to a realization. After all, no one turns down money. One day, Walter took his wife and son shopping at the mall. Since his son couldn't try on pants by himself, he asked Walter for help. Nearby, some young troublemakers began to mock Junior. Skylar wanted to confront them, but Walter stopped her. She had no choice but to comfort her son, whose pride was hurt. But then, something unexpected happened. Instead of keeping the peace as she thought he would, Walter confronted the group and without a word gave the ringleader a beating, even stepping on his leg with a show of dominance afterward. Although it was satisfying, it caught his wife and son completely off guard. On the other side, Jesse succeeded in purchasing a used RV. With everything ready to go, the pair headed to a remote area on the outskirts of town to get down to business. Concerned about the smell lingering on his body, Walter stripped down to nothing but his greasy muscles and a white underwear. Although it was their first time testing the waters, Walter's professionalism set him apart. As a chemistry whiz, he easily produced high-purity crystal meth. On the other hand, Jesse occasionally made mistakes and needed Walter to bail him out. Seeing the final product that Walter had created, Jesse instantly felt the gap between an amateur and a kingpin. Yet, Walter remained modest, simply relieved that his meth passed muster. After wrapping up the first day's work, Jesse urged Walter to continue production the following day, while he took charge of contacting buyers. The next day, Jesse visited a buyer known as Crazy Eight alone, who turned out to be Emilio's cousin. To Jesse's surprise, Emilio had been released on bail. He suspected Jesse had betrayed him since he had been caught while Jesse remained unscathed. After sampling the product Jesse brought along, Crazy Eight couldn't believe Jesse was capable of creating it, suspecting there must be an expert behind him. So, they kidnapped Jesse and forced him to lead them to Walter. Meanwhile, Walter was deeply engrossed in his work, oblivious to the impending danger. Upon arriving at the outskirts, Emilio recognized Walter, who he had seen with narcotics officers and suspected to be an undercover cop. The situation looked grim. Jesse tried to flee like a chicken but was knocked out. Seeing this, Walter didn't dare to make any rash moves. Just as the assailants were about to commit murder, Walter came up with a plan. He offered to personally teach them how to produce high-quality meth if they spared him and Jesse. Tempted by the offer, Crazy Eight and Emilio were intrigued. Walter led them into the RV to demonstrate. Of course, Walter had no intention of actually sharing his skills because he knew that even if he taught them, they would likely dispose of him afterward. Walter poured a bottle of red phosphorus into hot water and quickly exited the RV, closing the door behind him. An explosion soon followed from inside, and before long, there was silence. Walter wanted to wake Jesse, but the grass, ignited by a cigarette butt carelessly tossed by Crazy Eight, was ablaze and unstoppable. With no other option, Walter put on gas masks for himself and Jesse and prepared to drive away. But as the sound of sirens grew closer, Walter thought they were about to be caught. He aimed a gun ahead, but lacking the courage to confront the police and unwilling to face being captured, he considered suicide. However, unfamiliar with guns, he didn't even know how to disengage the safety, and his attempt to end his life failed. Just as Walter was ready to surrender, he realized that the approaching vehicles weren't police cars but fire trucks. His heart finally settled. At this moment, Jesse finally woke up, unaware of what had transpired, and looked utterly confused. Walter took this incident as an opportunity to share a bit of chemical knowledge with Jesse. Moist red phosphorus reacts with hot water to produce phosphine, a highly toxic gas. That's how Crazy Eight and Emilio paid the price for their ignorance. In the evening, upon returning home, Skylar queried Walter about his afternoon whereabouts. Walter offered no reply, opting instead to become amorous with his wife. This was a stark change from before when he had the will but not the way. This time, Walter truly showcased his virility. It was evident that with a newfound avenue for wealth, Walter had reignited his hope for the future. After the fire truck departed, Walter and Jesse managed to pull the car onto the main road. Despite Jesse's protests, Walter insisted on driving the car to Jesse's place to deal with the two drug dealers in the trunk. The following morning, Jesse, posing as a salesperson, called Walter's home phone, telling him that Crazy Eight wasn't dead after all. They needed a quick solution, but Walter was at a loss and could only stall as he went off to his job at the school. His unnatural behavior, however, sparked his wife's suspicion. 
She redialed the number, only to be met with Jesse's expletive-laden, bizarre voicemail, clearly not from a reputable person. She then traced the phone number to a website, and upon opening it, she was shocked to find it was Jesse's sales platform. Walter was preoccupied at school, unable to focus on teaching. He even misunderstood a student's question during class. The student asked if the day's topics would be on the final exam, but Walter heard it as if asking whether they would appear in a murder case. However, this gave Walter an idea. After school, he took two containers of highly corrosive hydrofluoric acid from the lab and drove to Jesse's house. Jesse, meanwhile, was tending to a wound on his face in his second-floor room when he heard a noise outside. Looking out the window, he saw the SUV's door ajar. Grabbing a baseball bat, he hurried downstairs to check, but by the time he arrived, Crazy Eight had already untied himself and made a run for it. He didn't get far before Walter bumped into him. Clearly not fully recovered, Crazy Eight staggered around and, in a panic to escape, ran headlong into a tree and passed out. Walter dragged him into the trunk of his car, and so the unfortunate soul was taken back to Jesse's house once again. The two confined Crazy Eight in the basement to prevent another escape. Jesse fetched a motorcycle lock from the garage and, without a word, locked Crazy Eight's neck to a column. Afterward, the two of them started a blame-shifting game. Walter complained about Jesse bringing two drug dealers into the mix, while Jesse retorted that if Walter hadn't approached him for drug manufacturing, none of this would have happened. They agreed that the matter of the living could wait, but the dead could not. Jesse reminded him that Emilio's corpse is still in the car. In this scorching summer heat, it won't be long before it starts to stink and rot. The smell will be detectable for miles. Fortunately, Walter had already thought of a way to dispose of the body, dissolving it with hydrofluoric acid, a method beyond Jesse's imagination. Walter was surprisingly resolute once he got serious. Moreover, to prevent any further complications, they could not leave the erratic Crazy Eight alive as he was a continuous threat. Initially, Jesse thought the idea of dissolving bodies was too macabre, but upon hearing the necessity of murder, he volunteered to take on the task. However, Walter wasn't foolish. He decided to assign tasks by flipping a coin. Perhaps it was Jesse's dumb luck, but he ended up with the body dissolving duty, while Walter was to take care of the killing. They then split up to carry out their tasks. Jesse went out to purchase containers for dissolving the body, while Walter pondered how to proceed with the killing. Despite his theoretical knowledge, he had never killed anyone. As he was grappling with indecision, Jesse called for help. He had spent half a day at the supermarket and still didn't know which containers to buy, worried that ordinary plastic buckets wouldn't withstand the corrosive nature of hydrofluoric acid. Upon hearing this, Walter was so frustrated that he had to give Jesse a crash course. He explained the hydrofluoric acid could be used to dissolve corpses and would not corrode polyethylene material. Jesse then asked about the progress of the murder plan, to which Walter, who had made no progress, could only bluff his way through the conversation. After hearing from the expert, Jesse boldly began his shopping spree, picking out a blue plastic container large enough to fit an adult. He even lay down in it to test it out in a rather conspicuous manner, as if he wanted everyone to know what he was up to. Meanwhile, Walter found plenty of potential murder weapons in the drawer. Knives, hammers, even a gun. But Walter didn't opt for any of these. Instead, he focused on the plastic bag used for packaging the gun. Planning to suffocate the still unconscious Crazy Eight, it seemed like a bloodless method that would be easier for a novice like Walter to handle. But as fate would have it, just as he arrived at the basement, Crazy Eight woke up, scaring Walter into a panicked flight, murder far from his mind. Thirsty, Crazy Eight begged Walter for water. In the end, Walter not only brought down two buckets of water, but also thoughtfully provided sandwiches, even making sure to take care of toileting needs, a surprisingly humane gesture. They chatted for a bit, but beyond learning that Crazy Eight didn't eat bread crusts, Walter gained nothing and couldn't bring himself to commit murder, which greatly increased his stress. Walter had expected Jesse to return with containers, but he came back empty-handed, unable to find any suitable ones. His explanation was that all the plastic containers in the supermarket were too small to hold a body. Hearing this, Walter was speechless and choked up with frustration. In his view, the solution was simple. If one container wasn't big enough, use two, one for the upper body and another for the lower body. Realizing his intellectual shortcomings, Jesse awkwardly changed the subject, asking Walter if he had killed Crazy Eight yet. Just then, a cough echoed from the basement, indicating that neither had completed their task. Since Walter had to accompany his wife to the hospital for a prenatal checkup, he had to return home first. At the hospital, he received some good news. Their second child was a healthy, developing girl. 
Walter had always wanted a daughter, and now in his later years, his wish was coming true. However, his happiness was overshadowed by sadness due to his serious illness, fearing he might not live to see his daughter grow up. After the doctor left, Skylar, noticing Walter's worried look, finally couldn't help but ask about Jesse. The website indicated that this person was involved with drug manufacturing and dealing. How could Walter be connected to him? Walter admitted he bought the illegal substance. Skylar was baffled, not knowing why her husband would do that. Walter was driven to this out of helplessness. Faced with Skylar's incessant questioning, Walter lost his temper for once and told his wife to stop meddling in his affairs. Skylar, seeing her husband's loss of control, was at a loss for words. The next day, after gathering his courage with drugs, Jesse finally began to dissolve a body. Just as he dragged the corpse from the car, an unexpected visitor arrived, Skylar herself. She came to warn Jesse not to sell drugs to her husband anymore, or she would have him taken to the police station for questioning. Jesse indeed took the blame for Walter. Fortunately, he was smart enough not to expose Walter's lie and played along with Skylar's act. Luckily, Skylar left without discovering the corpse. After the scare, Jesse managed to move the body to the bathroom on the second floor and started dissolving it in the bathtub. Walter came to Jesse's house after school, and they argued about Skylar's sudden visit. Walter insisted he didn't mean to frame him. After all, they couldn't disclose their drug manufacturing and murder. It was a necessary evil. However, Jesse was more worried about being caught by narcotics officers. Walter quickly explained that the person Skylar mentioned was related to him by marriage, and now they were in the same boat. This convinced Jesse that Walter wouldn't betray him. As they spoke, Jesse proudly stated that at least he had completed his task. Only then did Walter realize that this fool had attempted to dissolve a body in the bathtub. He panicked and looked up to see blood seeping through the ceiling, dripping onto the first floor floor. The next second, a large chunk of the ceiling fell down, along with the undissolved remains of the corpse. It turned out that the hydrofluoric acid had dissolved not only the body, but also the bottom of the bathtub. While this liquid doesn't corrode plastic much, it can't withstand metal or ceramic materials. Looking at the gaping hole in the ceiling, Jesse was speechless. He blamed his lack of education. As they looked at the bloodied human tissue scattered on the floor, Walter and Jesse had to gear up and start the cleanup. This scene made Walter think of years ago when he and his ex-girlfriend discussed the elements of the human body. Back then, he was full of vigor, a stark contrast to his current situation. After cleaning up, Walter flushed all the bloody water down the toilet. Then the two of them washed up in the yard. Once done, Jesse felt a weight lifted off his shoulders. Walter, on the other hand, went down to the basement alone to deal with Crazy Eight's feces. The man realized Walter didn't have the heart to finish him off and provoked him, demanding to be released or to be put out of his misery quickly. Walter didn't usually fall for such tricks, but as he was about to leave, Crazy Eight suddenly called out his name, catching Walter off guard. Moreover, he knew about Walter's relationship with Jesse and had some knowledge about his family. It turned out Jesse had earlier leaked Walter's information to Crazy Eight. Following this, he stirred up trouble, weakening the already fragile relationship between Walter and Jesse. Indeed, Walter was so infuriated by Jesse's big mouth that he kicked down the bathroom door and threw Jesse's cherished meth into the toilet. Desperate to save it, Jesse fished it out of the toilet with his bare hands. To secure it, Jesse simply threw it out the window and dashed out the door ready to drive off with the drugs. Walter was so angry he nearly had an attack. With no other option, he hurriedly chased after him, and at the last moment he caught up with him, risking his life. The two argued fiercely, with Jesse denying that he had leaked Walter's information and insisting that he had done his job. As for Crazy Eight in the basement, that was Walter's problem, not his. He then urged Walter to finish the job quickly. Then Jesse drove off, feeling completely justified. On the other hand, Skylar mistakenly thought Walter had become a drug addict and wanted to learn from her sister, Marie, about her experience in college. Marie, however, sensed there was more to Skylar's questions and guessed it was their son, Junior, who was using drugs. Even though Skylar kept explaining that Junior was a well-behaved child, Marie still secretly contacted her husband, Hank, to find an opportunity to give Junior a good talking to. It was hard to imagine that the righteous Marie was actually a kleptomaniac in private. In the shoe store, she skillfully switched shoes while the salesperson wasn't looking and left confidently wearing the new pair. After work, following his wife Marie's suggestion, Hank took Junior to a motel in his police car. This place was usually a hangout for drug dealers. Hank wanted Junior to see firsthand the ghastly state of drug addicts, who were neither fully human nor ghost-like. 
Soon after, Hank called over a passing prostitute who was also an addict. Thinking Hank was there to arrest her, she quickly explained that she didn't have any drugs on her that day. In reality, Hank was just using her to scare Junior. After all, her mouthful of rotten teeth was enough to give anyone nightmares and chilling hormones down his spine. Faced with Hank's well-intentioned efforts, Junior was just confused. He hadn't done anything wrong. The prostitute returned to her motel room only to find her client was none other than Jesse. It seemed that Jesse was a regular customer of her services. In the evening at Jesse's home, Walter was caught in a dilemma about whether to kill Crazy Eight or not. He listed the consequences of both killing and not killing. Murdering him would weigh heavily on his conscience, but sparing him could potentially threaten his family's safety. Just then, Skyler called, asking why he hadn't come home so late. Walter had no choice but to lie, saying he was working overtime at the car wash. Skyler immediately saw through the lie, having already called the car wash and learned that Walter had quit over half a month ago. She hung up angrily before Walter could explain, telling him not to come home tonight. During dinner, Walter made a skinless sandwich for Crazy Eight. However, as soon as he got to the basement, Walter had an attack, a severe bout of coughing, and he fainted in front of Crazy Eight, with the sandwich scattered on the floor and the plate shattered. It was some time before Walter regained consciousness. He cleaned up the floor and went back upstairs to make another sandwich, returning with it and a few cans of beer. Walter wanted to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Crazy Eight, he openly admitted he was terminally ill and didn't have long to live, but he didn't want to be a murderer. Yet, he didn't have enough reason not to kill. Through their conversation, he hoped to find more reasons to spare Crazy Eight's crazy life. Surprisingly, the talk went smoother than expected. They found they had a lot in common and got along well. Even more remarkable, they were from the same hometown. Crazy Eight's words about Walter's drug-making struck a chord. He was doing it to leave some money for his wife and children before he died. These words brought crocodile tears to Walter's eyes. He wasn't afraid of death, he was worried about his family's well-being. After a sincere exchange, Walter clearly let his guard down around Crazy Eight and made a decision to set him free. So, he went upstairs to get the keys to the padlock. As Walter crushed an empty beer can and tossed it into the trash, a thought struck him. He pieced together the broken plate and noticed a piece was missing. A dreadful suspicion formed in his mind. Worried he was wrong, he even rechecked the trash but couldn't find the missing shard. Walter went down to the basement and asked Crazy Eight to turn around. Thinking Walter was there to unlock him, so he complied. However, Walter's expression changed when he found the missing shard in Crazy Eight's pocket. It turned out that while Walter was unconscious, Crazy Eight had sneakily hidden a shard on himself. Walter confronted him, asking if he planned to use it to kill him. Crazy Eight didn't answer, but instead tried to use the shard to harm Walter. Luckily, Walter was prepared and grabbed the lock. Crazy Eight resisted, but in the end, he was strangled to death. During the struggle, Walter's leg was accidentally cut. It wasn't the outcome he wanted. He had already softened, intending to let him go, but Crazy Eight was not the same kind of person as him. It was a kill-or-be-killed situation. The next morning, after spending a day out, Jesse finally returned home. The neighbors were already out exercising, which made Jesse nervous, fearing that the events at home might be discovered. He hastily checked the RV, only to find its interior spotlessly clean. Upon entering the basement, it was empty except for a motorcycle lock lying on the floor. Crazy Eight was nowhere to be found, as if nothing had happened. Only Jesse knew that Walter had completed his task and had disposed of the body alone. Back at home, Walter found Skyler sitting on the bed, crying. The recent events had been too much, and he had not considered his wife's feelings, resulting in a severe loss of trust between them. With a pregnancy to deal with and a husband possibly addicted to drugs, anyone would be on edge. But Walter had a plan. He revealed his cancer diagnosis to Skyler. With such news, his wife had no more energy to question why he had not come home last night. Later, Agent Hank received a call about Crazy Eight's car found in the outskirts. They also found Walter's forgotten gas mask. Surprisingly, Crazy Eight turned out to be an informant planted by the Narcotics Bureau within the drug organization. After a thorough search, Hank found a bag of meth made by Walter, the same one that Jesse had taken to negotiate with Crazy Eight. The Narcotics Bureau was astounded to find the meth's high purity, even impressing the experienced Hank. Little did Hank know, the mastermind behind the drugs was none other than his brother-in-law, Walter. During a family gathering on the weekend, everyone was chatting and laughing. Hank, trying to boost Junior's confidence, boasted about how he won Marie over back in the day and encouraged Walter to share his own love story. But Skylar started sobbing. She wanted to announce Walter's terminal cancer that day, but couldn't muster the courage to speak up. 
In the end, Walter took it upon himself to break the news, leaving the unprepared family in shock. Later on, everyone gathered together to discuss Walter's upcoming treatment plan. Hank made it clear that if anything were to happen to Walter, he would make sure to take good care of Skylar and Junior. That night at Jesse's place, two close buddies dropped by for a visit. The greasy friend noticed a big hole in the ceiling and was curious about what had happened. Jesse made up a story on the fly and managed to bluff his way through the questions. The trio then found some fun in the following. The next morning, Jesse came to his senses and found his two friends had left. Just then, Jesse saw two motorcyclists outside the house, one holding a knife and the other gripping a grenade, looking like they were on a mission for revenge. However, this was all just a hallucination of Jesse's. There were no killers. The supposed assassins were just students coming over to proselytize. Although the hallucinations were drug-related, the root cause was the death of the two drug dealers. Jesse didn't have the guts for murder. Even though Walter was the mastermind this time, it undoubtedly cast a huge psychological shadow on Jesse. On Walter's side, Skyler successfully connected him with the best oncology specialist. But the first problem they faced was the cost of treatment. Just the consultant fee was as high as 5000 a significant expense for a family like Walter's. Skylar told him not to worry, assuring him that she would figure out the financials. Unexpectedly, Walter mentioned he could use his retirement funds in advance. Later, he sneaked into his room and opened a vent on the wall, revealing some hidden cash. Clearly, the retirement fund was just a ruse to reassure Skylar. Fortunately, the money he had was enough to cover the specialist's fee. This money was actually found on the two drug dealers by him and Jesse, and they had split it afterwards. Like Jesse, Walter was also affected by the murder incident, becoming very sensitive. One day, he planned to deposit the money into his checking account. On his way to the bank, he encountered a police car, which made him nervous because of his guilt. He pulled over to the side of the road and waited until the police car had passed before he regained his composure and continued driving. After finally waiting for a parking spot at the bank, a car cut in and took it. The driver was a wealthy lawyer in a suit. Encountering such an incident only added to Walter's frustration. While queuing for service, he had to endure the sight of this lawyer, who looked respectable but was actually a scoundrel, speaking obscenities on the phone with an arrogant demeanor that was simply unbearable. Perhaps everyone felt the same disgust as Walter, but no one dared to confront him and put him in his place. In the evening, a family of three was having dinner when suddenly there was a noise from the backyard. The couple went out to check, and to their surprise, it was Jesse. It turned out that the middle-aged couple was Jesse's parents. The family reunion was somewhat awkward, and without saying much, Jesse returned to his room and finally had a good night's sleep. When he awoke, it was already the next evening. Jesse's parents disapproved of him, feeling he was a letdown, only hanging out with bad influences and getting up to no good. Whether to let him stay at home was debatable. His father thought they shouldn't indulge him while his mother was soft-hearted. At dinner time, seeing Jesse dutifully setting the table, they couldn't bear to kick him out. Unlike Jesse, his brother was much more accomplished, with a room full of medals. When Jesse chatted with his brother, their mother pretended to come over to talk, but her real intention was to leave the door open, showing the parents' distrust of Jesse, fearing he'd lead his brother astray. Late at night, Jesse lay in bed tossing and turning. He opened a box filled with childhood sketchbooks, revealing his talent for drawing. As he felt melancholic, his greasy friend called, hoping Jesse could supply goods. He had found a buyer, assuring that if Jesse could guarantee quality and quantity, they could make a fortune. The next morning, without notifying Walter, Jesse went to his house under the pretense of saying hello, but really to ask if he wanted to continue making drugs together. After the recent drug dealer incident, Walter was considering quitting and didn't want to work with someone as unreliable as Jesse anymore. Luckily, Skyler was at work and not home, but Walter was still furious about Jesse's uninvited visit, telling him to get lost and not show up again. What Walter didn't realize was that Jesse wasn't completely heartless. Today, he had even brought 4,000, having not squandered the meth made by Walter, but instead sold it for a profit. Walter's attitude, however, hurt Jesse, who didn't hand over the money, but threw it all away. After Jesse left, Walter had no choice but to fish the bills out of the swimming pool. Jesse had just gotten home when trouble struck again. That morning after he left, the housekeeper found the drug in his room. This infuriated his parents. They could tolerate his misbehaviors outside, but bringing trouble home was too much. Facing his parents' questioning, Jesse was at a loss for words, and so he was kicked out. Just as he stepped out, his brother came to thank Jesse for taking the blame for him. It turned out it was his brothers, who had been worried about their parents' scolding and had thus framed his own brother. His brother even tried to take it back from Jesse, who crushed it underfoot, leaving home insulted. 
Walter finally had his appointment with the cancer specialist. However, his condition was worse than expected. The cancer cells had begun to spread. The specialist didn't rule out hope completely, believing that if Walter aggressively pursued chemotherapy, there might still be a slim chance of recovery. But this also meant that Walter had to brace himself for the severe side effects of the treatment. On top of that, the estimated cost of chemotherapy was around 90000 a sum that Walter and his family would have to find a way to secure. Skyler offered all kinds of comfort to Walter, encouraging him to face the treatment, convinced that he could beat the disease. She planned to take him to the hospital next week to begin systematic therapy. However, what worried Walter the most was the cost. If he were to invest 90000 and still lose his life, his family would be left with a massive debt. Walter expressed his desire to live, but also the need to be realistic. Junior, still just a child, couldn't quite grasp his father's dilemma. Frustrated at his father's reluctance to undergo treatment, Junior blurted out in anger that if his father was giving up on treatment, he might as well die sooner. Although Walter knew his son spoke in anger, the words still stung. Afterward, while passing by a gas station, Walter coughed up blood and had to pull over. It was there that he encountered the despicable lawyer he'd met at the bank previously. Already seething with anger, Walter found his perfect outlet. While the lawyer stepped into the convenience store, Walter went straight to his sports car, tampered with the engine, and caused it to explode. After venting his frustration, Walter left the scene. The lawyer, coming out to investigate the noise, was shocked to find his car blown up, clueless about who was responsible. In a way, Walter's act served as a rough piece of street justice against the lawyer's slick misdeeds. Jesse had a falling out with Walter and was then kicked out by his parents. But this didn't knock him down. Instead, he resolved to turn his life around. Dressed in a suit, he arrived at a company early in the morning to interview for a sales position. Despite boasting about his sales prowess, the boss was unimpressed, stating the need for two years of work experience and at least a bachelor's degree. Although Jesse had more than two years of sales experience, the products he sold were not exactly legal. As for education, he had dropped out of high school to make his own way. After rejecting Jesse, the boss, feigning kindness, suggested he could take a job like the people dressed in mascot costumes handing out flyers on the street. With his pride wounded, Jesse left the company and by chance discovered that the street advertiser was his close friend Badger, who was on parole and took the mascot job to appear like he was doing something legitimate. They chatted about drugs and Badger hoped Jesse would return to the trade having a buyer ready. But Jesse knew that his good reputation in the industry was only due to Walter's last batch of goods. Now that they had fallen out, he wouldn't get far on his own. In the end, Jesse declined Badger's suggestion, using his decision to quit the trade as his reason. Back in his car, Jesse looked down at the job recruitment ad in his hands. But with his background, finding a decent job would be challenging. After a mental struggle, he decided to get out of the car and found Badger. Meanwhile, Walter was attending the birthday party of his college classmate, Elliot. The attendees were either wealthy or of high status, making it clear that Elliot was a man of means. Through conversations between Walter and other former classmates, it was revealed that Elliot's wife was Walter's ex-girlfriend from college, and that Walter and Elliot had once started a company named Grey Matter. But, for reasons unknown, Walter had left the company. After greeting his old friends, Walter wandered into Elliot's mansion and into the study. Surrounded by understated but luxurious decor, he couldn't help feeling a sense of loss. Once, they had all been at the same starting line, but now his peers had achieved fame and fortune while he was just a high school teacher worrying about medical bills. Leaving the study, Walter saw his wife apparently talking to Elliot. Just as he was about to approach them, a former classmate stopped him, wanting to introduce him to some friends. To hide his embarrassment when asked about his current job, Walter took refuge in sipping the red wine in his hand. He and his wife felt out of place at the party, and awkward moments were inevitable. During the gift opening session, while others gave presents of high status, Walter and his wife's gift was a bag of instant noodles. Thankfully, Elliot understood the sentiment. He told everyone about the time in college when he and Walter had to eat instant noodles for a month straight to meet a deadline. Although it was just a bag of noodles, it was a gift heavy with meaning. Later, Elliot and Walter reminisced about their college days in a harmonious atmosphere. Elliot took the opportunity to extend an olive branch, inviting Walter to rejoin Grey Matter, offering a high salary and the best medical services. At this, Walter's face changed. It seemed his wife had already informed Elliot about his illness. Although his old classmate sincerely wanted to help, Walter's pride was too strong. In his view, unasked help felt like pity, which he could not accept. 
Upset, Walter left the party and couldn't help but reproach his wife for sharing his medical condition with someone who was no longer in their life. Skylar had only done what anyone in trouble would have done, but she didn't realize that her actions had wounded Walter's pride. Because of the events at the party, the next morning the family ate breakfast in a chilly silence, with no one speaking a word. Junior, who usually rode to school in Walter's car, chose to take the bus that day. On the other side, Jesse and Badger drove their SUV to the outskirts, preparing to cook meth. Guided by Walter, Jesse had indeed made progress. He had prepared various containers, no longer relying on a single measuring cup like a failing student. However, Badger was far from professional. Not only was he of little help, but he occasionally caused chaos. After much effort, they finally produced their first batch. Badger was excited, but Jesse could not share his enthusiasm. The purity was nowhere near that of the product made with Walter. In frustration, Jesse scattered the entire batch, much to Badger's heartache. Taking advantage of Jesse's return to the vehicle, he quickly recovered some of the discarded product. Before long, Jesse managed to produce another batch, but it still fell short of expectations. Although sellable, Jesse had seen the high quality of meth and was no longer content with mediocrity. He had become more ambitious and raised his standards for quality. When he was about to dispose of this batch as well, Badger couldn't stand it anymore. The raw materials had been hard for her to come by, and it seemed like such a waste. In an attempt to snatch the product from Jesse, a scuffle broke out in the car, resulting in the meth scattering everywhere. Enraged, Jesse pushed Badger out of the car and drove off alone. In the evening, Junior had gone to buy beer for a friend but ran into the police. Eventually, his friends ran off, leaving Junior, who had trouble with his leg, to take the fall. He would normally have turned to Walter for help, but instead, he called Hank to bail him out, a clear sign he was still holding a grudge against his father. Seeing that Walter was still refusing treatment, Skyler called Hank and his wife to hold a family meeting at home to decide whether Walter should accept treatment. During the meeting, Skyler was the first to speak. She knew Walter was worried about the cost of treatment, but now Elliot had offered to help. All Walter needed to do was accept the kindness of others. She also tried to convince Walter that accepting help from others was not something to be ashamed of. When it was Hank's turn to speak, he only offered remarks that didn't contribute to solving the problem. It was Junior who boldly voiced his opinion. He lashed out at Walter for not daring to seek treatment, calling him a coward. Despite being a child with cerebral palsy, his parents had never abandoned him and raised him with love. Even though life was difficult, he bravely adapted. He couldn't understand why Walter would give up on life so easily. Then Marie spoke, and her words took Skylar by surprise. She believed that Walter's decision should be respected. As a healthcare professional, she had witnessed the suffering patients endure during treatment. Many were not voluntarily undergoing therapy, but did so to satisfy their families. After hearing Marie's statement, to everyone's surprise, Hank agreed. This infuriated Skylar, who retorted that they were supposed to be there to help, not to make things worse. The ensuing argument threw the meeting into chaos until Walter made his position clear. He understood that whatever decision was made, it was meant for his benefit. He also expressed his deepest feelings. He couldn't recall when he had last lived for himself. He wanted the choice of how to spend the rest of his life. If his time was indeed short, he preferred spending quality time with his family over lying in a cold hospital bed, riddled with tubes and ravaged by medication. He wanted to die with dignity. With everything said, Skylar was not ready to give up. She reminded Walter that even if he didn't consider himself, he should think of his son and the unborn child in her womb. With these words, Walter's resolve wavered. If he still chose to stand by his decision, it might seem selfish because one does not live or die solely for oneself. His wife's words shook Walter, leaving him to reconsider. The next morning, Walter woke up to find a stack of books on his nightstand. There were books on parenting and others about fighting cancer. This made Walter realize that since he had fallen ill, he hadn't been paying enough attention to his family. His wife had been enduring in silence and making a lot of efforts quietly. After some thought, Walter made a decision. He went to the kitchen and comforted Skylar using his muscles, telling her he was willing to undergo treatment. Hearing this, Skylar finally relaxed. Her efforts hadn't been in vain. At the hospital, Skylar told Walter to rest easy and accept the treatment, and Elliot's check would be arriving soon. Walter also received a call from Elliot's wife, who was concerned about his health. She called to encourage him to accept help. However, Walter still refused, lying about the insurance company covering all the treatment costs. After hanging up, Walter didn't go home, but instead went to a yard. It turned out to be Jesse's house, where they hadn't seen each other since their falling out. 
But to earn enough money for his treatment, Walter swallowed his pride and sought out Jesse, hoping to work together again. Jesse was somewhat in disbelief to see Walter suddenly appear. Walter got straight to the point, asking if he was still in the drug-making business. It seemed the teacher-student duo was about to hit the streets again. They entered the RV, which was a mess from Jesse and Badger's previous fight. Seeing this, Walter could only shake his head in resignation. Although working together again was mutually beneficial, some ground rules needed to be laid out. Walter made it clear that he would only handle the drug-making part. As for dealing with buyers, he didn't want to know or get involved as long as there was no violence like before. In the following days, Walter became a master of time management. He was juggling his chemotherapy sessions, teaching classes, and discreetly running his money-making enterprise. And the fact that he had refused Elliot's help was still unknown to his wife and son. Later in class, Walter used mercuric fulminate as an example. It's a highly unstable and explosive compound that can only be formed into crystals. In a dry state, it's sensitive to shock, impact, and friction, and in short, it's highly prone to explode. As he spoke, Walter felt a wave of nausea and ran to the restroom. Clearly, the side effects of chemotherapy were starting to show. The school janitor was cleaning up and offered words of comfort and encouragement to Walter. In addition to hospital visits, Skylar sometimes took Walter to support group meetings for patients. She said it was to help Walter relieve his inner turmoil, but in reality, it was more about dealing with her own issues. During this time, Walter became secretive, always running out, and it was unclear what he was busy with. Communication between the couple had also diminished, causing Skylar to feel a growing distance in their marriage, which inevitably led to some resentment. The counselor asked Walter if he was hiding anything, suggesting he share it with his family. Of course, Walter couldn't reveal the truth. He lied, saying that after school he preferred some alone time to take walks outside and connect with nature. Almost everyone knew about Walter's cancer diagnosis except for Jesse. That was until one day, when Walter, working alone in the sweltering RV making drugs, could no longer bear it. Supported by Jesse, he barely made it to a chair outside. Seeing his near collapse, Jesse cooled him down. By chance, he noticed the red spots on Walter's chest and understood everything. Jesse's aunt had died of cancer, so he recognized the spots as markers used during chemotherapy. Jesse was somewhat angry about Walter's secrecy, but now everything made sense. Walter's change in behavior, his sudden willingness to collaborate, was all to make as much money as possible in a short time. At the moment, Walter was too weak to continue working. He tossed the gas mask to Jesse, signaling him to finish the job. Normally, Walter would never let Jesse interfere with the drug-making process. This was the first time Jesse was making drugs on his own since they started working together. Fortunately, he had closely observed Walter's process before and had improved his skills, managing to complete the task to the required standards. Then came the most crucial part, selling the product. Jesse ran around all night and succeeded in selling an ounce. The next day, he proudly bought Walter a new cell phone with the money he earned to facilitate future contact. He was also proud to hand over the cash to Walter. However, Walter was not pleased, criticizing Jesse for his low efficiency. They had produced 16 ounces, and at Jesse's rate, it would take ages to sell it all. Walter wanted to sell on a larger scale, meaning finding a distributor. But things were not so simple. There's a hierarchy within the drug trade. Jesse normally only had access to small-time dealers, and rashly seeking out a big-time drug lord for a partnership could potentially be deadly. On the other side, Agent Hank from DEA discovered a mark on a gas mask he had previously found, indicating that it originated from the high school where Walter worked. He took the gas mask with him to the school to investigate. From Hank's inquiries, Walter learned that the notorious Crazy Eight was actually an informant for the police. It was fortunate that he had killed him, otherwise his own secret might have been exposed. Hank confirmed that a significant number of items from the lab had gone missing and asked Walter who else had keys to the lab. Just as they were discussing, Walter's phone rang. It was Jesse, wanting to discuss dealing with a major drug lord. Walter had to feign calm and encourage Jesse to go ahead with his plan, thankfully not arousing Hank's suspicion. Hank couldn't fathom why drug dealers would think to steal from here, and advised Walter to be careful not to get involved. Although Hank mentioned it casually, it made Walter break out in a cold sweat. Jesse, seeing Walter's resolute attitude, had no choice but to compromise. However, a major drug lord wouldn't deal with strangers without someone to vouch for them. Finally, through an introduction by his close friend, Jesse successfully contacted the drug lord Tuco and quickly went to his base to make the exchange. The base was guarded by a bunch of henchmen, clearly indicating that Tuco was not someone to mess with. 
After Tuco confirmed the quality, Jesse thought he was in with a chance, but Tuco had no sense of honor, insisting on getting the product before paying. 35000 is not a small sum to be taken on credit. When the situation turned sour, Jesse tried to grab the meth and run, but it was difficult to escape from someone else's territory. Not only did he not get the money, but he was also severely beaten with a bag supposed to contain it until he couldn't get up. Walter also had a very nerve-wracking day. Just as he arrived at the school gate in the morning, he saw Hank appearing with the police. It turned out that the janitor was arrested because he had keys to the lab and had a history of two illegal occupations, plus some illegal substance was found in his car. It seemed all evidence pointed at him, and thus a good man took the fall for Walter. During a family card game that evening, despite having a bad hand, Walter managed to win against Hank through psychological warfare, hinting that Walter had already started a silent battle with Hank. The next day, Walter contacted Jesse, only to find out that he had been seriously injured by Tuco and was now lying unconscious in a hospital bed. Walter felt guilty about the janitor taking the fall and was distressed over Jesse's beating. Besides these outside troubles, Walter's body was constantly in pain from the side effects of chemotherapy, which had caused him to start losing his hair. Out of mind, he decided to shave his head completely. Perhaps this was not just a physical change, but also a sign of Walter's mental shift. He couldn't let Tuco's actions go. After learning the location of Tuco's base from Jesse's friend, Walter decided to take a risk and confront him alone. After a body search, he finally met Tuco, holding a bag that appeared to contain meth. Walter introduced himself with another name and was there to reclaim 50000 35000 was the outstanding drug money, and the remaining was for Jesse's medical expenses. Tuco found Walter's demand both amusing and irritating. However, since Walter had made such a bold request, he was clearly prepared. Walter took out a crystal he had brought, threw it to the ground, and caused an explosion. Tuco was taken aback by the unexpected explosion, calling Walter a madman. The base's glass shattered, and the room was left in shambles. Seeing that Walter still held the mercury fulminate, Tuco's men wanted to shoot, but Tuco stopped them, knowing that a direct confrontation would lead to mutual destruction. Under Walter's firm stance, Tuco not only paid up, but also planned the next deal with Walter, considering the high quality of his product. Back in his car, Walter clenched his fist and roared with the money he had risked his life for as the sound of police sirens approached due to the explosion. However, this time upon hearing the sound of police sirens, Walter didn't panic as he had before. Instead, he left the place with a smile on his face. Afterward, the school held a meeting to discuss the arrest of the janitor. Some parents criticized the school for not conducting a thorough background check before employing someone with a criminal record. Initially, Walter had felt a deep sense of guilt over the matter, but now he felt nothing. He was distracted during the meeting. It was clear that Walter was getting an unprecedented thrill from these risky behaviors. The next day, Walter made a special visit to Jesse and gave him his deserved share, which made Jesse feel somewhat better for not having been beaten up for nothing. However, Jesse was distressed upon learning that Walter intended to continue working with Tuco, providing two pounds of product every week. The problem was that the production of meth required a precursor called pseudoephedrine, which was difficult to purchase in bulk at once. Previously, Jesse had his guys buy sinus pills from different pharmacies to extract the pseudoephedrine. Now, the biggest issue was the shortage of raw materials. It was virtually impossible to produce two pounds of product in a week. A week flew by, and Walter and Jesse went to the agreed-upon abandoned parking lot to deal with Tuco. Perhaps to mask their nervousness and insecurity, both wore sunglasses and hats. As expected, even though Walter was a master meth cook, they only brought half a pound of product, which infuriated Tuco, who thought Walter was trying to fool him. Unexpectedly, Walter asked Tuco if he could handle four pounds of product. Jesse was stunned by the question. They were already struggling with two pounds, let alone four. Walter wasn't just speaking off the cuff, he had already planned. Rules are dead, but people are alive. Utilizing his extensive knowledge of chemistry, Walter thought of another method of production that didn't require pseudoephedrine. Technically, Walter and Jesse were at a disadvantage in this transaction, but Walter managed to take the initiative and gain the upper hand. He even demanded 70000 from Tuco as an initial investment, promising to deliver £4 plus a little extra as interest after a week. 
Though Tuco was angry after weighing his options, he chose to trust Walter and handed over the money. But he made it clear that if Walter screwed up again next week, he shouldn't blame Tuco for being ruthless. Nevertheless, employing the new method still required a significant amount of materials. Walter drew up a shopping list, naturally assigning the legwork to Jesse. As he looked at the professional terms written on the paper, he recognized each word, but when strung together, they completely baffled him. This made Jesse consider backing out inside. However, with Walter's mix of cajoling and brainwashing, Jesse complied obediently. During the time Jesse was busy sourcing supplies, Walter's home was the venue for a baby shower. He even took the time to record a heartfelt and moving blessing video for his unborn child. When it came to opening presents, Marie's gift to the child was a precious platinum hair accessory, which delighted Skylar immensely. Midway through the party, Hank and Walter stepped out for some air and a drink. When Hank produced a Cuban cigar, Walter pointed out that it was contraband. Hank, however, saw no harm in bending the rules occasionally for an unexpected experience. Walter managed to get one from Hank, who was initially reluctant to give it, especially since Walter was a lung cancer patient. But Walter insisted he had nothing to lose, and Hank eventually relented. Walter then asked him what exactly is the line between legal and illegal. Take drinking, for instance. If it were the 1930s, it would be illegal. Who knows, maybe one day meth and marijuana will be legal too. Hank didn't agree with Walter's perspective, suggesting a different approach instead, saying that some things should not be legalized in the first place. Meth used to be legal and easily available in drugstores, but thankfully it's banned now. After gauging Hank's stance, Walter didn't press the issue further. After the party, Skylar and Walter discussed the gift. She felt that while Marie's platinum hair accessory was valuable, it was impractical and thought it better to return it for cash to buy baby formula and diapers, which would be more beneficial. Walter told her to do as she saw fit. He then brought up a potential treatment option, mentioning Native American sweat lodges that supposedly helped with lung cancer treatment. He suggested they try it over the weekend. Of course, we all know this was just an excuse Walter concocted to free up time for his meth production. Hearing it could help with his condition, Skylar naturally supported the idea. The weekend arrived quickly, and it was only when Walter met up with Jesse that he learned the most critical ingredient, methylamine, hadn't been purchased. It turned out to be unavailable on the market, only obtainable by paying someone to steal it from a chemical warehouse, with the asking price being $10,000 right off the bat. Hearing this, Walter decided to take matters into his own hands. With materials at hand, he easily concocted a thermite mixture to break the warehouse lock. Despite its small size, it effortlessly melted through four inches of steel. That night, they headed to the chemical warehouse. To avoid detection, Walter handed Jesse a knitted ski mask, explaining it was the only thing he could find at the supermarket, better than nothing. They waited until the security guard left, then cut through the fence and snuck in. Unexpectedly, the guard came back for a restroom break. To contain the guard, they tied the restroom door shut with rope. Once the distraction was taken care of, Walter successfully used the thermite to melt the lock, and they walked away with a whole drum of methylamine. Over the next period, the two were finally able to focus on their business without worrying about a shortage of supplies. They planned to drive out to the suburbs to cook as usual, but unexpectedly, the RV broke down and wouldn't start. There wasn't enough time to fix it, so Walter made a snap decision to use Jesse's basement instead. Since two dealers had died in Jesse's house, it had gotten a reputation as a haunted place, and he had started to sell it. Living there was uncomfortable, and Walter was concerned that the real estate agent might bring potential buyers during the cooking. When Jesse heard this, he urgently tried to reach the agent, but they were busy and didn't pick up. While they were busy cooking underground, a group of prospective buyers, led by the real estate agent, arrived at Jesse's house. Hearing the noise above, Walter instructed Jesse to go up and do whatever it took to keep them out of the basement. Some of the visitors smelled something odd, and the diligent agent quickly used air freshener. As expected, someone really wanted to check out the basement. Jesse thought to persuade them to wait, but they wouldn't listen, so Jesse lied that the house was sinking and no longer for sale, thus averting the crisis. Meanwhile, Skylar also had a rough weekend. She went to a jewelry store to cash in the platinum hair accessory Marie had given her, but to her surprise, the store owner claimed it was previously stolen and suspected Skylar was the thief. She explained it was a gift for her unborn child, pointing to her belly. When the owner asked who gave it to her, Skylar didn't want to betray Marie. Facing the threat of the police being called, Skylar pretended to have breathing issues and that the baby was coming soon. The owner then decided to let the matter slide. After escaping, Skylar went to confront Marie, who adamantly denied ever stealing anything. 
After finishing his weekend work, Walter returned home, perhaps too exhausted to clean up. He rested on the sofa. Skylar, thinking he was unwell, handed him a glass of juice, but she noticed a strange smell on him. He hastily explained it was the scent of Native American herbs. Fortunately, Skylar didn't become suspicious. She told Walter how terrible her weekend was, how Marie's gift turned out to be stolen, and how she almost got arrested, with Marie not even offering an apology. Walter consoled her, saying sometimes people do unexpected things for their family. They know Marie has a stealing problem. It's purely a psychological issue. Walter's words seemed to be about Marie, but it sounded more like he was talking about himself. He was taking risks in cooking meth, all for his family, clearly trying to rationalize his own actions. A week had passed, and it was time for the transaction with Tuco. This time, Walter brought four pounds of the finished product. What puzzled Tuco, however, was the strange color of the product. It was an unprecedented blue. Walter explained that he had switched to a different method of production, but assured that the quality was the same. Tuco personally tested the product, and after confirming the blue substance was just as potent, he believed Walter. Everything was going smoothly until one of Tuco's underlings spoke out of turn, warning Walter and Jesse to remember who their boss was. To any bystander, it seemed like nothing but a lackey's attempt to flatter his leader, but Tuco took great offense, interpreting it as an insubordinate comment on who was in charge. The mood turned sour. Walter tried to calm Tuco down, but this only infuriated him further. In the end, the hapless underling was brutally beaten to death by Tuco, leaving Walter and Jesse staring in disbelief. Tuco killed the underling to make an example to ensure Walter and Jesse wouldn't get any bad ideas. Dealing with a violent drug lord like Tuco always came with great risks. A single displeasure could lead to a brutal fallout, as evidenced by the underling's grim fate. With that, season one of this drama comes to an end. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.